Well, as it's just clicked over uh, 18 minutes past six, and now we're all on the time zone, it's very exciting. Um, we're in this uh, quite limited outhouse this, uh, this afternoon, <laughs> this evening, uh, the Inside the Outhouse uh, first birthday bash. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the bash. Um, I guess the reason this outhouse is a bit more casual perhaps a little less formal without a formal topic is because I am aware of the fact that it is Easter Monday and it is also the start of uh, most people's uh, school holidays tonight. So I did uh, anticipate that we wouldn't have a, a good roll up but it, it is great to uh, welcome uh, everyone here and, and just say that uh, thank you very much for all your support of this project over the past 12 months uh, because without you Coming into this little Zoom meeting, um, it wouldn't be possible. Um, just going to uh, acknowledge, uh, just do a little bit of an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connection to lands, waters and communities. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to their elders past, present and emerging. Just while I'm on the mic, I'd like to uh, thank the amazing outhouse oligarchs who over the past 12 months have helped put this uh, vital community project together. They would be in no particular order, Cherie, David, Helen, Maddie, and Ellen. Thanks very much for all your hard work. Um, well, today we have a few announcements and one is gonna come from our colleague, Pete Griffiths, um, but we're also, um, Going to just uh, check in on how people are actually going uh, a year on from the pandemic and how things have changed. And um, as there's three of us, I'll just open it up to a pretty informal chat, I think. Welcome. Thanks, Pete. Um, shall I kick off with how we're traveling in the world of camps, perhaps? Absolutely. That sounds like a great place to start. If you think back uh, middle of March last year when uh, I think everything came to a grinding halt, um, it was a great start to the year. Everything was all systems go, a lot of camps out and about. And of course, uh, Australia um, called, pulled the pin on camps really quickly. Um, but at different parts of the, of the country, uh, camps came back. Uh, Queensland came back relatively early. Uh, South Australia, the same. New South Wales sort of crept across the line and Victoria sort of bumbled across the line in... Uh, November, uh, early December, WA got going a bit earlier than that. So one of the good things was having a, a, I suppose, a country which is divided into states that come together at different times is that as each state re-entered the, the market, if you like, or the, or, the, or the work again, we're able to learn from that state and push that further uh, to those states that hadn't yet re-entered. So we had, we're able to learn a lot from the um, experiences of the Queensland uh, camps and outdoor sector. But it wasn't just us. I mean, uh, I look across the world. I speak to my colleagues in the International Camping Fellowship regularly, particularly in America and uh, China. And they are still in a state of disarray. I think America has just got a couple of states across the line to regain, uh, rejoin um, summer camp this year. So they look at us and think, well, you know, initially uh, our fairly severe approaches were, were kind of... Um, looked on with alarm, but looking at us now, they see we've actually pressed on quite well. So in many ways, Australia has able to come through this quite quickly in the, in the outdoor sector, and we've actually led the way in many ways. So I know that um, uh, hasn't been much kind of uh, comfort for the people in um, perhaps Victoria, which came to the party late, but uh, look across other parts of the world, America, uh, Russia, China, uh, the UK, Europe, we are in a much better place than they are. And I think one of the things which we learned out of the whole process was um, to do better at actually advocating. So a lot of the things we know and, and uh, assume, um, we've got much better at articulating and talking to government about. And I think last year was one of the, I think it was the first time I heard many premiers actually use the word camp in a sentence on screen. And that was actually a, a great step forward for us. So having come out of 2020, um, battered and bruised, but still kicking on. Um, I think it's just gone to show how important camps and lit outdoor activities are for the community, uh, not just for schools. You can see the demand in, um, in the community groups and schools now uh, through the roof 
our own inquiry portal is about three months ahead of the game where we normally would be. So we're going to be putting in well over a thousand inquiries to our member camps this year. That just goes to show folks just really need to get back out there and get back together again. And I think um, building market confidence now is one of our key, key points. Um, and I think we've got to take a, a good strong lead in that one because there's still an element of uncertainty every time there's a lockdown, there's a worry about a border and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, kids particularly, uh, older people, folks with disability, really need to get out there and do things. So I feel fairly bullish at the moment. I know that we've got some issues, particularly around workforce and, and um, shortages of staff. Uh, and also perhaps around things like, uh, more systemic things like insurance, but we're working our way through those. And I look forward to, um, you know, Australia cracking on and showing the rest of the world the way as always. Uh, yeah, thanks for those critical comments, Pete. Uh, like, I couldn't agree with what you said more. I think uh, we we have uh, shown the lead to a lot of the world. Can you, is there anything specific, I guess, within the camping sector in Australia that we've done that you could perhaps highlight to this forum that uh, is perhaps something that has taken us uh, ahead in the way that you described? Yep, I think that each of the state outdoor peaks um, have really worked well together with the national bodies, such as ourselves and the Christian venues. And that collaboration, um, sometimes across, uh, I'm going to go so far as to say competitive lines, that collaboration has really given us a lot of strength uh, as a sector. And so you've only got to look at the work that uh, we've done with the Christian Vendors Association and with each individual state peak, in particular, up in Queensland, which really led the way. Dom did a power of work, um, getting the COVID safe plans up and running fairly quickly. And that just leads people to, to show or to see that there's a lot of expertise and skill in the sector. And you know, I was asked um, in about November whether the sector had a COVID safe plan. And I said, well, we've had one since April. And that's been constantly tuned and adjusted since that date. And we learned day in day, we learn new things. We continue to learn new things as group sizes change. Um, you know, permits and those sort of things. But um, I think the one thing we've really shown is that um, we're really good at actually telling our story now and, and using social media and using uh, imagery and videos and other countries have seen that and um, tried to get on board. And, and I know that it's probably easy to say that, but we also have the advantage of um, history. You know, our culture is a long history of, of camps, whereas um, uh, America in particular struggle because uh, if I strive the path politically, it struggled a bit because their president wasn't necessarily uh, helping things happen rather than, than stopping things happening. And you only had to look at how the Centre for Disease Control was being uh, manipulated and hampered early on. So we got, got runs on the board quickly, we learnt quickly, and we got established with the political parties quickly, and we worked together really quickly. So I think they're the key things for me. Pete, um, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, since it's just a pretty small uh, group, just the three of us, uh, you want to talk about the upcoming conference and um, uh, what your aspirations are with that and, well, and we can uh, throw that out on the socials if you're still looking for more people to be involved, um, as in participants uh, turning up. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So we, we run a conference every two years. It's, it's uh, deliberate that we do that. We want to keep things fresh. Um, also, we know that running a conference takes an awful lot of time uh, out of our, our own team. So running a conference every two years helps us to keep ourselves fresh, but also generate some good fresh content. And uh, last conference was in 2019, it was in Caloundra. That was a, a good one, had a great time, learned a lot of things. This year it's in Victoria, in regional Victoria. Um, and the idea is that, uh, first of all, we committed to a face-to-face -face conference pretty early on in the piece. Um, some folks said we were crazy, and at times we thought we might have been crazy ourselves, but community to face-to-face -to -face is really important to us because uh, we are in a relationship-based industry. Everything we do is about relationships and community, and we wanted to make sure that we gave people an opportunity to come together, particularly because camps are, and, and many operators for that matter, are quite spread across the country and don't often get a chance to meet up face-to-face -face and talk and share experiences and just seriously just have some fun. 
it's actually been a fairly hard year, obviously, for everybody last year, financially, emotionally, physically. And this uh, this year started with a bang, so term one's been pretty intense. So we want to use this conference as a way to literally pump some energy back into the sector and pump some fun and pump some love back to people because I think they've earned it. The theme is recharge. Everything is about putting energy back in, uh, about some really interesting speakers that aren't the normal speakers. We've got some interesting cats uh, having a chat about all sorts of things around looking after yourself, but also optimism uh, around, um, you know, taking the time to look at your business now that you've got a bit of headspace rather than be in your business, those sort of things. But also literally have some fun. We always have our, our conference dinner, which generally turns out to be a fairly big affair. And, um, you know, what, what happens at the conference stays at the conference, but we have a good time. I think um, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, we do have at the moment about 120 delegates registered from about 70 organisations, and that's a couple of days old, so I know it's up, gone up since then. People from four states come in, Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales, and Victoria. So it's a pretty diverse bunch. And um, yes, if you did want to join us, uh, it's not too late. We can certainly do um, more people on board. We've got all the obvious COVID safe plans and, and social distancing, distancing things in place. The venue is all over it. It's the RACV Goldfields Resort in Creswick just outside of Ballarat. So we are well and truly lined up for a cracker. It is next week. Um, I know that uh, Jess and the rest of my team are um, nervous, but well and truly ready for it. Um, we're going to have some fantastic little gifts to give away to sort of uh, inspire and energise people. And if you want to find out more, the um, website has it there, which is www.ozcamps. Go to events and click on the conference tab. The program's there, the registration's there. And yes, it is about camps, but it's also about the outdoors. So if you're a camp manager or an outdoors person or a camp staff person, it's not just about management. It's not just about senior leadership. It's about everybody coming together to share ideas and literally, um, I think literally share uh, the experiences of last year and share the things I've learned and go forward into 2021 with uh, confidence and optimism. So that's the plan. We are in the blocks ready to go. And unless something drastic happens between now and next uh, Wednesday, that's what's gonna happen. And I'm not gonna moz myself, but at the moment we're all looking good. <laughs> Excellent, it sounds like an amazing uh, opportunity and a, and a great experience for um, all the participants. Uh, so thanks for that. And um, we'll, we'll get the word out through our social media channels um, in the next 24 hours. Yeah, thanks Dave. And thanks Pete, thanks for the opportunity to chat. and. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, get this out and about for others through the recording and, and just let folks know that uh, if they're keen to have a crack, um, yeah. we're keen to see them there. Well, it, an interesting statistic well, is a large amount of our listening audience uh, can't actually be in the uh, face-to-face the -face, uh, Zoom meeting for various reasons, family commitments and work commitments and other things, but lots of people uh, do listen online, so we'll definitely share that message widely on our website and on our socials and what a fabulous event it sounds like. Looking um, forward to it. While we've uh, got the three of us just chatting, um, the burning questions which we did put together for today, which are, I guess, relevant to the year and they'll perhaps take the conversation down a, a different road. Um, but the second one, I'm particularly interested in both your opinions. What has changed for you in the professional or personal world in the last 12 months since the start of the pandemic. And if we could hear from everyone, that'd be really good. After you, Dave. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, yeah, uh, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's been more of a, uh, yeah, a reality check on how I've always known that our industry uh, especially in my role of being a facilitator, still uh, a field operative, uh, an instructor, whatever you might, uh, whatever label you might uh, choose to put on a, uh, somebody who's still carrying a backpack and walking up and down hills and uh, running running sessions, uh, how not very resilient our industry has been, even though we've bounced back very quickly. And yeah, that's attributed to certainly uh, our, our peer bodies and all the work that's been done that was mentioned by Pete. But also, I think by um, just the fact that we've, as an industry or as a sector or, or as a profession, um, 
we're starting to suddenly wake up to the fact that we need to be asking harder questions of ourselves, both professionally, but also uh, how the rest of the world sees us and how we're valued in our industry. And yeah, and getting involved in a lot of uh, social media through the outhouse um, has helped me to see that, yeah, we, we are, we do still struggle with that. Uh, you know, definitely uh, still articulating what we do and who we are and the value we bring to the young people that we work with, which I find having been in the industry 26 years now, um, quite frustrating uh, that I see the same conversations reappearing, uh, especially in the last, uh, since the start of the year, there's been a, a big uptick in those conversations online and, and which has brought about uh, obviously some positive stuff from the OCA with their national summit that's uh, forthcoming and uh, and no doubt that'll probably uh, flow into discussions that will happen at the National Heather Ed Conference as well and conferences that you know, are being held at state-based state, state level and the ACA one. Um, but yeah, it, it is at the grassroots um, on, a, on a Monday morning at eight o'clock uh, at the briefing being talked about over coffees about, yeah, the state of the industry and where it's at. So I think that's that's been the biggest change for me. It's become more, and it might be because I'm thinking about it more, uh, but it's also, I think, because more people are thinking about it that it's become something that is not just, um, you know, the albatross that I've been um, carrying around for a while, uh, being someone who's been in this industry for a while. Um, that's probably all that's changed for me. I, yeah, uh, in regards to, you know, practice, there's very little changes, I find, which is a rather nice aspect to it, um, outside of a lot more cleaning and hand sanitising, which was probably something we should be doing for years anyway. Possibly, yeah. Well, I might throw my 10 cents worth in. And I reckon, uh, first off, uh, uh, I said before that um, the outdoors is very much about community. And I think in the outhouses, uh, obviously struck a nerve by helping to build that community. So hats off to, what was the term, Pete? The oligarchs of uh, in the outhouse uh, and to yourself, of course, for driving this forward. It's been a obviously a really useful conversation for them. Um, it does help us break down state barriers. It also helps educate people and bring people on. I know Dave just referred to the fact we're, we're having a conversation around certain topics, which isn't the first time those topics have arisen in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So I guess what I would learn out of that is what I'd like, like to take out of that is um, what are we going to learn from the fact these conversations have been had before? What are we going to do differently this time? And what are the barriers to helping those things progress? And uh, I think one thing that's come to my mind over this last 12 months is, you know, we're all outdoor educators. We're not trained HR slash IR experts. We're not um, trained advocates. We're not trained lobbyists. So when we expect to make big change um, using our collective knowledge and experience, sometimes we don't proceed particularly well. And that's only because we don't have those specialised skills. And I, I think realising that um, should actually give us a bit of uh, confidence and satisfaction we've achieved as much as we have. Because at the end of the day, uh, the ones that get the most progress in these places are the ones that spend the most money. And we don't have a huge amount of money to employ specialists. So to get to where we are using our collective uh, small pockets and um, brain power has been, been a great achievement, I think. I also think that these issues seem to come across generationally. You, know, you look back not so long ago, well, actually the start of last year was bushfires anyway, but you know, 10 years ago we had massive fires, um, disastrous fires with hundreds of people uh, lost, dozens of properties and camps lost. Uh, 10 years before that, it was probably GST. Um, along the way, there are all sorts of these blips that follow up and how we pull together and overcome those things um, or survive and, and get through to the other side is actually, uh, you know, one of the great things about the outdoors. But having said that, I think this last 12 months has been a bit of a rude awakening for some. And part of it has been because uh, we do tend to trade on the quality of our relationships and our, our, um, our uh, I suppose, our uh, connections with our clients and our schools in particular. And I know many, many camps and outdoor operators struggled a lot with cancellations and uh, loss of deposits and those sort of things last year. Lots of, um, at times, fairly ugly language going around the place and perhaps some pretty unpleasant uh, threats from some of our nearest and dearest. And I think what that showed me was that 
although we have fantastic relationships with our teachers that come on programs, we don't have fantastic relationships with the ones who sign the bills or the checks, the invoices. So unless you have a very strong relationship with the school bursa or the school principal or the school board, to say that you're in a partnership with that school is probably a little bit self-delusional. And I think when it gets to the crunch and that school then picks up its uh, toys and wants to leave the playground, it actually wasn't a very pleasant understanding for many people. So I think learning those things about really good, strong uh, legal relationships, as well as um, you know contractual, I should say, as well as uh, delivery is really important. Um, and also I think uh, in the last 12 months, I think we've probably sat back in our laurels a little bit based on previous experience and, and worked off the assumption that everything we did is fantastic. You know, the quality of delivery is fantastic. Uh, you know, the communication is fantastic and clearly it can be a lot better. And for us to move forward now, um, we need to do more than just talk. Um, we need to actually deliver some really good outcomes that are dependent upon the client, not, not necessarily educational, but good strong outcomes that we can talk about and celebrate. I think if we sit back now and go, uh, we're there, we've done some great work, we're only halfway there, that work never ends. And our um, evolution and our educational skills uh, have to increase as, with every year that goes by. So I actually feel like we're, we've got a very good strong base to come off, but I don't want to ever sit back and just take things for granted. I want to be pushing always to help camps and any lead outdoor educator, lead outdoor journey educator um, do a better job through whatever resources that I might be able to provide through the ACA or, or my colleagues or in the outhouse can provide. Uh, well, that's hard to follow up. The sage has spoken. Um, wise words, Pete, thank you. Um, I guess what I have learned uh, both personally and professionally over the last 12 months, having established this nice little forum inside the outhouse is sometimes my personal and professional worlds meld a little bit more than uh, they have in the past. It's really, uh, personally, it's been a period of time where I've really sat back and evaluated what I'm actually doing and whether I'm in fact really invested in that and not just the work I'm doing, but perhaps my personal philosophy around education in the outdoors and and what it, what it really means to me. I, I've done a lot of soul searching about those subjects. Um, 12 months on, uh, having learned a massive amount about uh, managing an online Zoom forum and talking to people over the internet, uh, I feel like I, I feel like my skill set uh, as an outdoor educator has perhaps taken me a bit towards that place that Pete spoke of, where I can actually have more uh, candid and realistic conversations with board members and school principals and other people who actually need to understand the power of outdoor ed rather than you know, just my uh, colleagues having a beer in the pub after work. So I think that's really the first thing for me. And the, and the second thing I've just, and I keep going back to these three words and Pete earlier described it, our, our industry as a relational industry. And I think that is, is so true. And I've come up with these three words, which I think I've sort of put together from other things I've done, but I think they keep coming back inside the outhouse all the time and they are communication, collaboration and connection. And I think that if we across the sector, um, and I prefer that word to industry, um, are doing those things and doing them well with all of the players, um, not just um, the, the on the ground instructors and not just management, but actually providing a sort of a communication link between all the people, then I, then I think we're we're doing good work. But I but I also agree that I don't think we should sit on our laurels and say, oh yes, it's all going really well and we're doing the best work we can do, because there's examples where perhaps we could do things better, perhaps we could plan better, perhaps we could evaluate better, perhaps we could train better, and I and I think we need to keep questioning ourselves and and our practice 
so that basically we we are giving our client groups, whether they be school students or university students or whatever they are, the best experience they have they can have when they're in the outdoors. I've written down those three C's, Pete. So that's going to live on. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to bring bring them more into the forum when I <laughs> present about inside the outhouse in uh, the NOAC conference in uh, 2021. Hopefully, Very they haven't good. actually submitted my uh, accepted my abstract yet, but hopefully they're going to. Well, I've plagiarised it already, so um, yeah, uh, we'll go for it. It's, it's not it's not copyrighted. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that came to mind is here we are talking to each other in on Zoom, and um, you know. One of the things we've talked about with the outdoors has always been isolation from technology. And clearly uh, that way of thinking uh, can't continue to exist. I mean, you know, technology is um, not something to be avoided. It's something to be embraced and, and used productively. And clearly in the outhouse has done that extremely well. Uh, I think if we try and work outside of that, we'd, we're literally being, I think it's King Canute trying to hold the tide back. It's not gonna work. And why would we, it's just counterproductive. So, um, yeah, I think that's one thing I've learned is uh, technology can actually be very, very effective and very, very useful, not just in connecting with people, but telling our story. And social media is obviously um, has its purposes and has its misuse as well, but it's a very strong tool as well. Mm. And I'm just going to just maybe discuss the idea of sector versus industry, because I think that's always a difficult one for us and one we've dipped in and out of for a long time. And the word industry always seems like it's too harsh or, or formal or, or somehow not quite the way we want to look at ourselves. But the only thing I would say is, and I agree, I think sector is a nicer word, but I, but I do think that when we're talking to government, industry is the sort of word they're looking for. And when we can actually uh, articulate the size and scope of our industry better, and we're better at now, then we'd be better at chance of being heard. But, you know, Personally, sector fits what I feel like I've been doing in my professional life, but industry, unfortunately, probably holds more words uh, in the government world. I think that's a very valid point, Pete. Pete, that's oh. a, a lovely segue. Um, I might I might just jump in and, and say uh, congratulations and commiserations. You <laughs> announced uh, over the weekend that you were moving on from your role as uh, CEO, as at ACA, um, what's next and, and, and what's your vision? And hopefully we're not losing you to the corporate market or somewhere else where we, we can't see you out there uh, campaigning for uh, what we do. Um, you're not losing. Uh, and, and, if you don't, and if you don't, you don't want to, <laughs> if, you don't, if, you, if you don't want to tell us, that's fine. If it's all still, uh, you know, uh, not, not public, but um, you, you put it out on LinkedIn. So I just, yeah, um, wanted to say, uh, uh, reiterate what Pete had mentioned, um, in a post on behalf of the outhouse team, you know, uh, your, your commitment in the last five years to the ACA. And um, we're, yeah, I've been aware of it um, since you moved from OEG and, and, and went to the ACA, uh, all the work you've been doing in, in the background there. And a lot of it's in the background and uh, uh, doesn't go very recognised within the grassroots level, the field level. But, you know, a, a lot of that work is very important and very vital. But yeah, what, what's next for Pete Griffiths? Because our audience wants to know. I'm sure they do. Well, the, the reason I uh, popped that thing up on LinkedIn on the weekend is not um, to uh, attract brick bracks and congratulations. It was merely to let people know that there's an opportunity out there and hope that people will actually spread their networks and, and spread the word through the network. So it is advertised uh, on uh, uh, I think Bex, Wigan, Stokes are the, are the organisation who are doing the recruiting. And for me, it's simply a matter of saying, well, um, uh, I think these sort of roles take a huge amount of energy. I haven't actually lost the energy, but I do feel like it's a really good time to hand over to someone. It's The Australian Camps Association is in a really good spot um, in terms of our own staff, our own ability to move things, our own financial capacity. And it's lovely to hear our board now say, we've got this money, what are we going to do with it? And that's a really big question. And I think that whoever comes in now is going to have a chance to, to you know, really move the game forward. And I'm not talking about entirely just about camps. I'm talking about the way that the Australian Camps Association can work with other organisations to move the whole sector forward because um, we've got the capacity, we've got members all over the country, we've got great connections, uh, great history and great talent and skills. So 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, it's hard to actually articulate it. I, I'm, I'm excited that I'm going to be handing the, the reins over at a time of my choosing. I'll be sad to feel like I won't have any more direct contact or influence over that part of the organisation, but I'm certainly going to be involved in the future in some capacity in the outdoors. I don't intend to go working for some hideous commercial conglomerate. I'm certainly interested in pushing the agenda further forward, and whether it's around inclusion or diversity, which I think I've been pushing fairly hard the last few years, or whether it's simply about raising the sector's professionalism um, and capacity to do good. Um, you know, I don't think you ever walk away from this world, do you? It's always part of us because that's what we do in our spare time, what we believe in. So um, I guess the last thing I'd just add is really if, if people do know someone who might be a good fit and I, I honest to God, hope it's not an old white bloke. I hope it's someone with a bit more uh, of a bit more of a diverse background. Um, could have a crack at this role because it's got a great capacity to, to, you know, make great change in the future. All right. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, we'll get we'll get the word out as well. Cool. I guess the last burning question as we sort of move towards the end of the session is what are the challenges that you gentlemen see for the uh, moving ahead in 2021 and uh, perhaps further on in the outdoor industry? Uh, you said industry then, Pete. I'm, I'm going to pull you up on that. <laughs> well, I think... Um, I don't know if folks have noticed, obviously there's been a lot of conversation in the last uh, six months around employment, training, those sort of things. Um, and I do see with a little bit of alarm that things like enterprise agreements are becoming um, weaponized and that um, uh, our staff capacity is one of those things which really holds us back at the moment. And I think coming out of last year when there was limited capacity to train people um, limited capacity to retain staff. Um, there's been a fairly ferocious uh, continuing, um, I suppose, recruitment cycle for the last couple of months, which has got quite um, uh, serious, I suppose. I think one thing that I did learn out of last year, which I probably should have mentioned earlier, is that uh, those organisations which were able to keep their staff teams engaged even when they were furloughed or stood down, have managed to retain their staff and have them come back to work very well. Those that have not done so very well have really struggled to recruit and regain their capacity. And I think that, again, talks to our ability to, to uh, maintain our relationships. So I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm, I'm a little worried about the fact that uh, there's huge workload at the moment, um, huge pressure to regain lost financial um, capacity from last year, uh, limited staff I talked about, and perhaps limited capacity to train. So I do feel like we're in a bit of a dangerous situation at the moment when people are trying to push the envelope a little bit, perhaps to gain a bit more cash, perhaps to satisfy a school and so forth. But I just urge people to be really careful. Now's not the time for our sector to uh, be in the, in the limelight for the wrong reasons. So. Um, I guess be patient. We are going to regain strength. We are regaining strength, but uh, it's really important to do it in a really controlled way, which really focuses on quality. And quality isn't just about safety. It's about outcomes. It's about looking after your staff teams. It's about the way we portray ourselves and the way we actually do our work and hold our heads up high as professionals. And, uh, you know, we are incredibly professional. Um, I'm looking at the, the, the faces on the screen with me now. I know we've been in the sector for a long, long time and between us, between our sectors, there's a huge amount of capacity to do a lot more work. So I'm just urging folks to be patient, be careful, and um, be optimistic for the future because it's very, very bright. David, your turn. Uh, thank you. Um, challenges for the rest of the year. Um, and beyond, David, and beyond. Yeah, yeah and beyond, yes, I know, because I wrote the question. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, I, I guess, keeping the momentum of what we've been doing here in the outhouse moving forward, because I think there's a need for it. And I think um, if nothing else, the pandemic uh, has shown us the need to come together as a community uh, more than just once every three years at a national conference or uh, yeah, at various workshops um, and doing it via Zoom, 
you know, on a Monday may not be the solution, but it's a start. Um, and definitely coming, um, having that discussion with the people who are shouting into the void that is social media about wages and salaries and conditions and getting quite agitated with each other about it um, maybe isn't the solution right now. So perhaps finding a way to uh, bring these voices that are very passionate to a, to a central point to thrash it out, work it out, and move forward uh, in a positive way. And uh, and for me personally, I just need to finish my degree and um, find another job that I can um, uh, be comfortable and engage with again, um, doing within the industry. So uh, that might be the bigger challenge for me uh, than uh, actually finishing my degree, finding a, a role within the industry at my career point. But um, we'll keep looking and uh, stay positive about it. Hey, thanks, for the, thanks, for, thanks for those words, Dave. Um, 2021 um, and beyond. Um, I think this vital community forum inside the outhouse, um, I'll go as far as saying it's actually changed my life and it's changed my relationship with the outdoor industry. I've talked to people in this forum over the past 12 months who I never would have talked to before. Mm -hmm. uh, connected with people internationally and across Australia who I'd never would have spoken to before. My uh, hope is that these type of forums um, become more often and more regular. And we continue to have these conversations because I think, um, and I, I, I guess I'll just share one thing. I, I think there, there has been a lot of chat over the long weekend that we've just fit, uh, about to finish in every state in Australia about these various issues that are going on in the outdoor industry. Um, and I think that it, it saddens me somewhat that people don't feel comfortable that they can yet come in here and kind of have that conversation with like-minded people. Um, you know, and where are the 50 people who've been making comments on social media over the last three days and why are they not here having the discussion with the other people? Because I think we need to get together as a united group and we need to then take our united message, whatever we decide that is, um, forward. This is one reason I'm really looking forward to being part of the OCA National Summit and, you know, I've heard various comments about that particular event throughout the outdoor sector. But, like, I, I think it's a group that has potential and I think it needs to be national. I think it needs to be a national conversation. And these are the things I like about the OCA National Summit because I, I, I think we need to think as a nation of outdoor educators, a nation of outdoor leaders, a nation of outdoor instructors as we go forward. And we need to set some perhaps national standards and national parameters around our industry sector. That's what I'd like to see. I'd also like to see um, this forum uh, find a way to earn some funding so that I could do it more regularly. 2021 yep. and beyond in a nutshell by Pete Smith. Very good. I just want to pull up one thing in there and that is, um, uh, I don't want to sound negative. I think these conversations around uh, workforce planning and, and employment have been going for as long as all of us can remember, but it doesn't mean we can't continue to have them. and, and I'm certainly not in a situation where I'm going, well, I've heard this all before and don't want to do anything more about this. I think I'm looking forward to hearing the new generation of thought. I'm looking forward to perhaps um, incorporating what we've learned over the last couple of decades into that thinking. Um, so we don't just go around in circles, but um, I do want to hear where this is going because uh, just because it might not have worked in the past doesn't mean it won't work now. And, um, you know, everyone has got the capacity to influence and change. And yes, we are a national um, kind of sector, we all know the staff move between states and move between um, places of employment. Why is it so hard? You know, we've got to fix these things up. That's my five cents. I might just stop, uh, stop the soapbox and let you speak, Dave. 
No, completely agree. I, I've got nothing else to add on that in that regards. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see it happen. Uh, in my lifetime, it'd be nice. To... <laughs> Yeah, like we're, 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 we've all spent, like, you know, it's a relationship uh, industry and it's also a traveling industry. We, we travel a lot for work mm -hmm. um, and we all have been a part of that. And I, I don't see that part of the industry sector is going to end anytime soon. So as we travel so much for work, why can't we also travel in our conversation and discussion about where we're going to take the sector in the future? Ooh. It's another one to write down. Oh, I'm full of them. I'm <laughs> full of them. Um, just a couple while I while I've got your undivided attention, a couple of very cool things that are happening inside the outhouse um, in the future uh, is we feel very proud and honoured to be presenting uh, to the ARRE, uh, the Association of Outdoor Recreation and Education, which is the US based. Mm -hmm. uh, organization, I believe the peak body for outdoor educators and uh, teachers and instructors in the US. Uh, we are presenting at their Coffee and Conversation session on the 4th of May 2021 at the very early uh, time of 6 a.m. for those who live in Australia, but not as early as those who are in the west of the country who it will be 4 a.m. Um, but uh, we would love to have uh, Australians uh, join that, uh, that webinar that we're presenting. And, uh, or if you can't join, perhaps listen after it has gone down. You know, the International Camping Fellowship also is running similar um, online sessions at the moment. And I know that uh, they'd be very keen to hear uh, from you as well so i'll give you a connection to those guys they're running a thing called the academy at the moment which is really not really an academy in the sense of a teaching session but really an academy of mind so uh, i will link you up with them and i'm sure they'd like to hear your experiences that oh, sounds fantastic peeps thanks for that yeah i've been i've been getting well actually they've been about 10 o'clock on a middle of the day type uh, thing they're really good sessions uh uh, I've been in a few of them so far and um, they're very informative and um, yeah, great, great speakers um, uh, who have been presenting those. So yeah, well, thanks for that, Pete. Appreciate that. Well, I'd like to uh, wish you happy Easter. And at this point in time, I'm just going to end the recording and um, feel free to stay for five and have an off recording chat. <laughs>